Welcome back to The Sound of Science, my most amazing science students. I'm your host, Amy Myers, and also your teacher. And I hope you are ready for that dive into biochemistry. And if you're not, I totally understand. Biochemistry gets a really bad rap. It seems very convoluted, very confusing. Um, a lot of students find this unit to be one of the more challenging units that we're going to do this semester. But what I want you to remember is that atoms follow rules. And really all we're talking about are atoms and how they form into molecules and the effect that that has on living things. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why atoms behave the way they do and how that influences the molecules that we need in order to live. So, Let's start with a review of the atom. The atom is made up of three particles, a positively charged proton, a neutral neutron, and a negatively charged electron. The proton and the neutron both weigh about one atomic mass unit, or AMU. This means for every proton and neutron that you have, your atom is going to weigh one mass unit. And what you find is the protons and neutrons tend to group together. Um, so they group together in the center of the atom, forming the nucleus of the atom. Now, the next unit that we do is going to be on cells, and we'll talk about a different type of nucleus. But for this case, what we're talking about is the nucleus found inside the atom. So the number of protons that we have determines how the atom behaves. So if you have two protons like this helium does, then the atom's going to behave like a helium atom. But if we were to take one of those protons away, the atom would actually change and would now become a hydrogen. Hydrogens only have the one proton. As far as electrons go, the number of electrons can fluctuate. Sometimes they can have more electrons, sometimes they have less electrons, and that just means that the atom becomes what we refer to as an ion. Ions can be positively charged or negatively charged. When you think charges, I want you to think about um, electrical charges or think about how magnets can be charged. Um, and in fact, that whole magnet analogy is going to become really important when we start talking about the bonds between waters. The other thing that can happen is neutrons might have an increased number or a decreased number. If we add or we remove neutrons, we're actually going to end up with what we refer to as an isotope. Isotopes are radioactive, um, or at least they can be. And oftentimes they're gonna be used in medicine as well as used in other ways. But um, one of the things that we talk about is like, for instance, um, heavy plutonium. It, it, it's a naturally neutron rich atom or element. And ultimately that's what's going to make it radioactive. Um, but when you think about radiation for cancer treatments, it's the same thing, the same type of isotopes we're talking about. So let's take a minute and let's talk about these electrons because that's actually kind of important. When two or more atoms of different types bond together, we're gonna to call that a compound but this is going to change the properties of the elements when they bond together. And a lot of times people are curious as to how these atoms bond together. Okay, I'm gonna move myself out of the way real fast. There you go. Atoms bond together into molecules using their electrons. So let's go back to what we know about atoms. Atoms have their nucleus is in the center with their protons and neutrons, right? Nice, densely packed. And then in clouds outside, they have electrons that sort of swirl all around the outer edge of the atom. The electrons have specific areas where they like to kind of hang out. And the outermost shell of the electron 
is considered, it's, it's called its outer valent shell. And that's the one that's most important when we talk about bonding. Now, obviously the shell we're talking about is not the type of shell that you have like, like a snail shell. This is just basically the outer sphere that surrounds the electron. Okay, two atoms, hydrogen and helium, have only one shell and their shell only has space for two electrons total. Hydrogen only has one electron. It actually tends to be really unstable because of that. That's why hydrogen explodes. Um, helium has space for two and it feels reasonably stable because both of those are filled. Now, every other atom is going to have eight in its outer valence shell, or at least space for eight electrons. The closer to eight electrons the outer shell has, the more stable the atom will be. So when you talk about atoms and you say, okay, so it has three electrons in its outer shell, that's not a very stable atom. It's going to seek to bond with other atoms so that it can feel more stable. It can be more stable. If we're talking about one of the noble gases that have eight electrons in the outer valence shell, they're actually pretty stable already. Um, and, and really they don't, they're not looking to bond with anything. They're, they're pretty content just the way they are. And obviously I'm, I'm personifying these atoms. They're not really thinking through. They don't really have a brain. They're not sitting there going, oh, I feel so unstable. I could just explode. But I think it helps us to sort of see the way these electrons influence how atoms bond to each other. Okay. So the first two types of bonds I want to talk to you about are ionic and covalent. Ionic bonds is when one or more electrons are transferred from one atom to another. So the two atoms come close together and one of the atoms is gonna donate its electrons to the other atom. Usually this is going to happen between atoms where if this atom can lose one or two electrons and that empties its outer shell, so now its outer shell becomes the next one down, and this atom can gain one or two electrons and fill its outer shell, that's when we're going to see an ionic bond. Covalent bonds are more like atoms that co-parent. They're going to co-parent their electrons. So covalent bonds are when atoms are going to share the electrons between them. So sometimes the electron will hang out with one atom. Sometimes it'll be hanging out with the other atom. Again, just like co-parenting, right? So hopefully that will make sense as we move forward. All right. I know that was a lot of information, um, but I needed you to understand how the electrons work and how that bonding takes place. And really the whole reason for that is I need you to understand how water works. So water is an oxygen with six electrons in its outer shell, bonded to two hydrogens, each with one electron. When they bond together, the two molecules both are seeking more electrons. Hydrogen and oxygen ultimately are going to form a covalent bond with, um, between each other, first of all, which is it's a very strong bond, but they're going to form this bond because there's not enough electrons for everybody to be happy. So they're gonna co-parent those electrons. But water is different, it's special. And because the oxygen atom is so much bigger than the hydrogen atoms, the oxygen actually pulls a little bit harder on those electrons. It's kind of like the oxygen has primary physical custody and of these electrons and the hydrogens just have occasional visitation. And because of that, the oxygen ends up negatively charged. It has more electrons than can be counterbalanced by the protons. And the hydrogens are actually gonna end up 
positively charged because now they really don't have the electrons with them all the time. This actually makes water a polar molecule. It has one end that's positive and one end that's going to be negative. And this gives us hydrogen bonding between water molecules, which is what this picture is depicting. So the little randomized Mickey Mouses that are kind of all hanging out in different ways, I still think they look a little bit like Mickeys, um, they're actually going to be those charged particles that oxygen, the red oxygen is going to be negative and the hydrogens are going to be positive. And what happens when you take two magnets, a positive and a negative, and you try to stick them together? Well, they actually stick. They stick to each other. And because of that, the oxygen from one atom is going to form a weak bond with the hydrogen of another. So the water molecules actually stick to each other. And this gives water really, really neat properties. Without it, we don't have life on this planet. So this is important. This is a big deal. Um, the other name for those hydrogen bonds that occur between the water molecules is actually van der Waals forces. Another place you might hear van der Waals forces um, is actually on geckos. When geckos are climbing up a wall, they actually form these little van der Waals forces between the wall and their toe pads. And that's why geckos are able to stick to things. Um, but regardless, these van der Waals forces, these hydrogen bonds make water very, very special and very important. Let's talk about some of those special properties that water happens to have. Um, the first property I'm going to talk about is cohesion, and that's just what we were just talking about. How the molecules of water stick to each other, how they stick together. Um, and this is what gives a surface tension. Um, if you've ever tried to belly flop into a pool and it hurt, this is why it actually forms a film on top of the water because the oxygen and hydrogen atoms actually line up a certain way. And it's because of that cohesion, because those bonds are there. So when you belly flop into a pool, you are having to break all of those bonds at one time. And even though they're weak bonds, you still have to break them. Adhesion is what allows um, molecules of water to stick to other things. So if you've ever been in the car and it's raining and you see how the water is dripping down the window, but it's kind of stuck to the window, that's adhesion. That's water molecules being attracted to the glass molecules. Cohesion and adhesion actually work together and allow for capillary action. Um, if you ever had your blood taken, they do a finger prick and then they use a little tube and just sort of wick, wick it away. Or um, if you've ever had to do a glucose test where they take the little testing strip and they just touch it to a drop of blood on your finger and it sort of pulls it in. That is capillary action. It's just allows it to be sort of pulled through the small tube. Um, we see the same thing with plants. Plants actually use capillary action to pull water up their roots into their leaves. So heat capacity or more specifically, specific heat capacity uh, is something else that water has um, a lot of. It actually has a very high specific heat capacity. And this is just the amount of energy that we need to raise the temperature of this, the liquid, making the molecules move faster. So waters is very high and it requires a lot of energy to vaporize water. Um, Due to this, we actually have uh, the ability for the area we live in that has so much water to sort of have a mild climate. Um, have you ever wondered why we don't get as much snow as other places that are the same temperatures as we have? And really be because they're not. We don't get snow as often because the ground never gets cool enough. We have so much water in the ground and the water holds on to that heat and it takes a lot of heat to get that water to go away. Um, one of my favorite examples of this was my cousin who lives in California. She called me 
one day and I mean, it's like May and she is like, it snowed. It snowed last night. Well, she lives in California and you think of California as being hot and, and it is most of the time, but they live in what's called the high desert. They actually live up in the mountains in California in the desert. And because there's so little water around, it actually lets their temperature change by a whole lot. Um, so here, you know, it's, it's warm during the day. It might cool off a little bit at night, but we still have some pretty warm nights. In the desert, it's going to be very warm in the day and then very cold at night in comparison, a bigger temperature difference. And it's because of that specific heat capacity. Something else that we need here is this evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling is a result of that heat capacity, but basically what it means is that when water does evaporate, it's going to take a lot of heat with it. This is why sweating cools you down. So if you have water on your skin and it evaporates, it's going to take a lot of that heat from your body with it. And that is why sweating is used to cool you down. That's why dogs pant and they sweat through the, the, their paws, um, the pads of their paws, if you guys weren't aware that dogs do that. Um, and and it's the same reason that the, um, if you guys have seen the cooling towels that people get and they'll put them around their neck and it's supposed to cool them down, they work by the same basic principle. And it's all because of these properties of water, because water is polar. Again, just to drive this point home, surface tension, because those water molecules crowd together at the surface, they create that strong layer. This is the reason belly flops hurt. Um, and this also allows bugs to sometimes float on the surface of water. Polarity, the polarity of water really makes living things possible. It allows for all these different chemical reactions to take place in our body. Why? Because our body is mostly water. We have so much water content in our cells, in the cytoplasm of our cells and throughout our body. Our blood is made up of a lot of water. And so because of, of water special properties, it's actually able to be what we call the universal solvent. It's able to dissolve more things than most other liquids. And because of that, we are able to have a lot of these chemical reactions take place um, that otherwise wouldn't. Water is able to dissolve so many things and allows for these reactions. A final note about water and its really cool properties. We're going to talk about density. So density is how closely packed the molecules are. Okay, The more dense something is, the more tightly packed the molecules are. Ice is less dense than water, which at first is you're like, okay, yeah, ice floats in a glass. I got it. Icebergs float. Okay. Ice is, you know, less dense than water, whatever. Let me explain why, because this is actually really cool science. So because of the polarity of water, as water shrinks down and gets closer and closer, it condenses and the molecules get closer to each other as water cools it actually gets to the point where the oxygens are too close together and they start to repel one another. So let me slow down and explain that a little bit better. When you have um, an item moving from or a material moves from one state to another, right? It goes from a gas to a liquid to a solid as it does so, it's condensing. The molecules are getting closer together and moving a lot slower. So as a gas, it moves around really fast and it's got a lot of space. As a liquid, it's still moving and it's got some space. As a solid, they're really very tightly wound together. So then ideally, as water is getting colder and it's getting closer to that solid state, it should be getting slower and closer together. But because it's polar, those oxygen molecules, as they get too close to each other, it's like putting two negatively charged magnets together. Have you ever tried to do that? Have you ever tried to put the same charge magnet against each other? They always slip off or repel one another. Um, that's why they say opposites attract, because it's true, at least in the case of magnets and bonds. So 
as you get those molecules closer together, they start to actually repel one another. And so ice, as it's forming, it actually, you know, the water condenses and condenses and condenses until we get to four degrees Celsius. Once we hit four degrees Celsius, it's actually going to pop apart just enough and it forms this lattice structure, which are ice crystals. That lattice structure allows for air to enter into the structure of the ice, meaning the ice has more air in it, making it less dense, so it floats. Um, this is also why ice expands as it cools. That's why you can't put a water bottle in the freezer with it all closed up and full or it'll burst your water bottle. It'll pop out through the top. So all of this is important. This, the fact that ice floats, it actually allows the water underneath it to stay insulated. It actually keeps it warmer, keeps it from freezing as well, um, which is why, number one, we don't walk across frozen lakes because we never know how thick the ice is and if it can support you. But number two, this also allows organisms to survive underneath it. Um, and of course, if you live in an area that is not Southern Virginia, you may actually have places where lakes will freeze over and you can actually go across them and it's safe. Um, but here in the South, we, we just don't have that. All right, I'm gonna move me around a little bit while we're doing this. Um, I just wanna to quickly touch on mixtures. Mixture is when you have two or more elements or compounds. Um, they're physically mixed together, but they're not chemically bonded to each other. Um, the solution is um, when it's evenly distributed throughout, it's uniform, um, like think salt water. The solute in the case of a solution is whatever is being dissolved, like the salt. The solvent is whatever substance is doing the dissolving, like the water. Remember, water is the universal solvent. The other option, if it's not a solution, it could actually be a suspension. I'm going to move myself out of the way here real fast. Okay. So a suspension is when substances do not dissolve but they actually break down into tiny pieces and they form a suspension, or you might see them suspended much like the picture that I uncovered right there. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about um, acids and bases and there is not a good spot to put me. So I am just, I'm gonna go up here for a minute and I'll move when I need to. Okay, so acids, bases, and buffers. So acids, Bases and buffers you've probably heard of, you've probably um, seen pH testing in some sort. If you have a pool or a hot tub, you've definitely seen pH being tested. Um, lots of times if you go to the hospital and you're very sick, they'll test your pH, the pH of your blood. Um, it's important for humans that we stay on about a seven. We really like to be neutral. So we want to have about a seven on the pH scale. Um, the pH scale is essentially going to stand for um, the potential hydrogens. Um, and that's really because things like acids actually release hydrogens into the solution. So if you have more hydrogen than pure water, um, you're actually going to be found below a seven on the pH scale. I know that seems really counterintuitive. That's just the way they do it um, because it's potential hydrogen, not what's actually there. So the more hydrogens you have, the lower it, it anyway, just go with it. Below a seven on the scale is acidic and it's because it's releasing hydrogen ions into the solution. Bases are going to be above a seven on the pH scale. Um, they have less hydrogen ions and um, actually have more OH. It releases the OH ions into the solution. So buffers are going to be weak acids and weak bases. And they actually, we have them in our bloodstream. It allows us to maintain homeostasis, those stable internal conditions. Um, if we start to get a little too acidic, then a little weak base is going to come along. And when the acid and the base react to each other, 
One's releasing hydrogen, the other one's releasing hydroxide. What this does is this actually forms H2O or water. So they'll form water together. And so that's why these buffers are really important. Um, some examples. Acids are going to be things like stomach acid, orange juice, lemon juice. Black coffee is actually acidic. Not, not good for your teeth, guys. Um, things that are going to be neutral, water. Pure water is neutral. Things that are basic, um, going up to a 14 on the scale, and I'll move this out of the way for you. Um, things like cleansers, soaps, drain cleaner, bleach, baking soda, all of these things are what we consider alkaline or basic. Um, this is the reason that if I have an acid and I need to dump it down the drain, one of the first things I need to do is actually neutralize it with something like baking soda. Baking soda can neutralize the acid so that we're not pouring acid down the drain. So it's really an important thing.